Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV. Today we're talking to Patrick Byrne, a PhD and the CEO of Overstock.com. Uh, let's talk about Overstock.com. Uh, Describe its business and why should people shop there? Uh, the business is we're basically an outlet store on the internet, heavy deep. They're in, the, in the edge of retail, there are these folks that you and me usually never meet, you and I, and they're sort of bada bing, bada boom, I know the guy, I know the guy, I got this deal going at Seiko, he's got something in Polaroid, you know, that world. Well, we're, we sort of have our feet in that world, we bring it on to the internet, and then we wrap it up in great customer service. So it's the reason to shop there is you'll save a lot of money. One of the reasons we're talking to you in D.C. is that you're in here to, uh, you're talking to people about the Delahunt Enzi bill, which is a bipartisan uh, attempt, uh, Democrat and Republican, to get internet and catalog vendors to collect sales taxes for remote purchases. Um, an estimated $30 billion goes uncollected each year. What, uh, what's wrong with you collecting sales tax? Uh, why shouldn't online retailers have to play by the same rules as bricks and mortar operations? Well, first of all, back in the early 90s, there was a Supreme Court decision, Quill versus North Dakota, that said it's too onerous. There's 7,000, it's too onerous for a catalog company to have to collect taxes. I'm more like a, you know, internet companies or now catalog companies. There are 7,000 taxing jurisdictions in the U.S. In one jurisdiction, cotton candy is food. In another, it's, you know, entertainment or it's candy. Different tax rates. How can we possibly know the tax rates in 7,000 jurisdictions? That's reason number one. Now, they say, well, we can create databases and overcome that. They haven't done that yet. Even if they do, we put a lot lesser load on uh, a local infrastructure than it does to build a target. When you have a target there, you've got employees, you've got to have roads, you have schools to, for the employees, children to go to and such. We don't impose nearly that load, so it isn't fair that we should have to pay those taxes. Uh, let's talk about one of your other issues, which is short selling. Uh, short selling uh, is a practice in which investors uh, borrow stock and then resell it later, hopefully at a loss, uh, so that they pocket a difference between what it was lent for and what they pay it back for. Are you against short selling in principle? Not in the least. Short selling is fine. Short selling is fine. It and injects information into the marketplace. It's a useful activity. How, what information does short selling inject into the marketplace? <clears throat> well, it injects information it, when people are bet, think a stock is going to go down, when they think it's overvalued. They're, they're uh, accepting a cost, the cost of borrowing the shares. And by doing that as they sell, it does put their opinion into mm -hmm. the marketplace. What I have a beef against right. is naked short selling. I feel like I'm out there campaigning against sexual harassment, mm -hmm. and people come back and say, oh, no, 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 sex is good, sex is fine. Well, sexual harassment isn't a type of sex. A sea lion is not a type of lion. Naked short selling is not really a kind of short selling. Okay, now in naked short selling, people are talking about selling shares that they don't even own yet or have borrowed. Correct. And why is that worse than uh, regular short sell? Well, because they've avoided the cost of actually borrowing stock. Uh, the information they're injecting is literally value less. What, uh, you uh, are a uh, libertarian, you're a hardcore capitalist, and yet you're also a, um, an advocate of good regulation. Yes. How do we, what is good regulation of financial markets and what is simply self-interested regulation of uh, financial markets? Well, what we have now is self-regulated uh, regulation, uh, self-interested regulation. The, the Wall Street has captured the regulatory body. Good regulation, and when it comes to the clearing and settlement system, it's simply we should have a settlement system that actually settles stock, would be better than a settlement system that allows there to be this much slop. Uh, I know it seems confusing because people say, well, you're a libertarian, you're against regulation. You know, uh, my understanding of libertarianism includes that there's a role for government in preventing force and fraud. Well, force and fraud uh, can exist, especially in the financial marketplace, because it's the essence of a financial company to be in the business of saying, I'll take your money now and I'll give you something later. If you're if your car hits a tree, you all you know, so it's a busy, financial industry in general is very ripe for fraudsters. Um, Do you okay. think the uh, the economic uh, crisis that we're in, or the financial situation we're in, is it a result of lack of regulation or deregulation, or is it bad regulation? It's bad regulation. It's two things. It's bad regulation, 
and it's captured regulators. And we have extensive regulatory capture in DC, as I've been discovering for four years. Uh, so the whole argument about we need more regulation seems to me misguided. I'm reminded Joseph Schumpeter said that capitalism stands before the jury of intellectuals, and they or the jury already has the guilty verdict in their pocket. They're just waiting to hear the indictment read. So we, it isn't that we need more regulation. We need better regulation, and we need to stop regulatory capture. Are you selling Schumpeter at Overstock.com? I suspect there's a warehouse of his works you know, that yeah. is, you could get at a deal. It's, right. he, he goes way too unread. You're a huge advocate of school choice. Talk a little bit about the Milton and Rose Friedman Foundation as well as your efforts to expand school choice. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I was ble extremely blessed to, uh, to meet Milton uh, and Rose in, uh, uh, some years before his death, and I had be just been become gradually a big advocate of school choice. I think that a lot of issues I see the left and the right fight about really are just downstream effects of a terrible education system. Uh, Milton, in, uh, in a rare example of bad judgment from Milton, he, uh, well, I, I succeeded him as, as co-chair with Rose Friedman of the, of the Friedman Foundation for Educational Choice. Um, so that's sort of how I got involved in, in uh, that. Why is school choice important? <laughs> well, from an economic point of view, ultimately, in the marketplace, people's outcomes are going to be determined by the human capital that they acquire in education. There's other things, and if you're seven feet tall and can dunk a basketball and stuff. But the human capital you acquire through education ultimately is what the marketplace rewards. Now, libertarians like to think of themselves as transcending the left and right, and I would think that this would be the, the ideal issue. Because when I see the left and right fighting about social inequality, racial inequality, income inequality and stuff, that's all downstream effect of what people's educations are. And if, you know, largely. And if you have, if you have one school where a kid's graduating with a bucket of human capital and another school where, he's getting a where someone else is getting a thimble full, their life prospects are set. So all the politics that are about the downstream stuff, that's, that's rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. This is, this is the, the issue. Are you hopeful uh, for school choice, or what, what's the development in school choice that excites you the most? Well, uh, Ed, uh, some of our, you know, the problem is, gee, I'm, I am ambivalent about the prospects right now. Some of the more noteworthy successes are getting rolled back. DC, mm -hmm. the DC voucher program being a prime example, which is just heartbreaking and which Reason TV has done a nice, a nice story on. Uh, on the other hand, in one form or another, maybe not under the name vouchers, but under, under different, uh, you know, with different words, the idea of giving parents choice seems to be catching on. And we discussed earlier some uh, a program in Oakland, for example. But I think that different mutations on vouchers are, are starting to emerge. And, they, and it, the good thing is, as they make success, as they have success, say, in Arizona, and they expand the tuition tax credit, it's harder and harder for politicians to roll it back because it, it develops a constituency. Yeah. What are your intellectual and uh, ideological influences and roots? Uh, why, why do you call yourself a libertarian, and, and what does that mean? Well, I'm basically a Yankee. I was a Yankee Republican, uh, and which meant I, the truth is I don't see, so, so what appealed to me is the idea of social freedom, government, you know, in New Hampshire, a New Hampshire Republican believes government pave the roads, build the post office, stay off my porch. Mm -hmm. So we look at the Republican Party today, and I don't recognize it. And all these people who want to get involved in your life and what you do with yourself, and that's, that's not the Republicanism I grew up with. On the other hand, the Democrats are so anti-market and statist and against economic freedom uh, and I, that I can't go with them. So uh, I used to say, you know, a libertarian is somebody who's a, a left-wing Democrat on social issues and a conservative Republican on fiscal. The Republicans are no longer Republicans mm -hmm. on fiscal, so I don't know where that leaves, yeah. leaves us. I want to thank Patrick Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com and a PhD philosopher who really knows the world of things as well as ideas for talking to Reason TV today. I'm Nick Gillespie.